So we're continuing this morning in this series, The Shabbat Chronicles. The title of this message is simply In Pursuit. In Pursuit. And this morning, even though we've been in the book of Luke, I want to just start off, and I'm not staying in this passage, but just to, as a prelude to open up with um, a reading from the Gospel of Luke, where the Lord gives us this beautiful invitation to stop being anxious, to stop worrying, and to trust. He calls us away from restlessness and anxiety, the, the restlessness and anxiety that is in pursuit of us. And he invites us to pursue his kingdom. He says, so I say to you, Matthew 6, verse 25, so I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds. My phone starts ringing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Hypocrite. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your Father in heaven feeds them. Are, they, are you not of more value than they? And which of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. Now, if in this way God clothes the grass, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little trust? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For the pagans eagerly pursue all these things. Yet your, heavenly fa your Father in heaven knows that you need all these. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thank you, Siri, for, for reading along with me. I felt like I was copying. Stop copying me. And then in Matthew 11, uh, you know, when the, when the Bible, when the Gospels were written, when the Bible was written, by the way, um, the chapter breaks that we see, the verse breaks, weren't there. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this passage that, we're, that we're, we're familiar with. It says, Matthew 11, 28 says, Come to me, all you, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. At that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on Shabbat. And so this is the story where we've been and it's preceded by him saying, come to me, I will give you rest. So as we look at Shabbat, I want us to go back now where we're going to look at the command. But we're going to pre precede that with Exodus 19. Exodus 19, 3 says, Moses went up to God. And Adonai called to him from the mountain saying, Say this to the house of Jacob and tell B'nai Israel, tell the children of Israel, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you listen closely to my voice and keep my covenant then you will be my own treasure from among all people, for all the earth is mine. So as for you, you will be to me as a kingdom of Kohanim, of priests, and a holy nation. These are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. The Lord speaks to his people. He speaks to the children of Israel. He's about to give his word, his instruction, his Torah to the people. And this is the prelude to Exodus 20, which, of course, is the Ten Commandments. Um, it's 
Technically, it's the ten words. It doesn't say mitzvot. It's devarim, which is words. These are, these are the words of the Lord. These are the words he spoke to them, words of instruction, words from a loving father. So before he gives these words of instruction, the Lord wants us to remember his heart toward us, to remember his intention toward us, to see the, the instructions that he gives us flowing from the heart of one who says, remember how I brought you out, uh, out of slavery on eagle's wings to myself. And now I'm going to give you, choose life. The, the, the instructions flow from the relational heart of a father who loves us. I want you to remember, he says. Remember what you saw. You've seen what I've done to those who would enslave you, who would crush you, who would dominate you and abuse you. I have broken off the chains and have carried you myself. I've carried you to myself on eagle's wings. I am your rescuer. Don't forget that. I snatched you from the death clutch of Pharaoh because I want you to be free and to walk in freedom. That understanding is the premise and the driving intention behind every word, every instruction, he says, that I'm about to give. If you will, he says, if you will listen closely, and he, basically it's a double of Shema. If you, Shema Tishmu, if you will, Shema, Shema. Listen, listen and do, listen and do. To hear the, the, the word obey is, is implicit in Shema. To not just hear, but to hear and do. It's one whole act to Shema. If you will truly hear me, a hearing that is naturally accompanied by doing of what you hear, then you will really live. So this morning, what, what I want us to do is we look at the, the command, the word, the instruction of Shabbat, which is the fourth command. We're actually going to kind of look, we're going to look at the first one and the tenth one and then the fourth one. It says, God spoke all these words saying, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Verse 8, remember Yom Shabbat, to keep it holy. You're to work six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Shabbat to Adonai, your God. In it you shall not do any work, not you, not your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. For in six days Adonai made heaven and earth, the sea, all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day, ceased on the seventh day. Thus Adonai blessed Yom Shabbat and made it holy. And then verse 17. Do not cover your, covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, there is an order to these commandments, to these words of instruction. The first three commands, the first three devarim, are focused, pointedly focused on love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They are pointed upward. And commands 5 through 10 are horizontally pointed, focused on human relationships. Love your neighbor as yourself. But this fourth command actively involves loving God and loving people. It is the intersection where loving God and loving neighbor meet. Look up, God ceased. Now you are to cease. And look around. It's not just you who are to cease. Your, your rest is not to be on top of your neighbors, your servants, the outsiders among you, even your cattle. And then later, the principle of rest for the land we even see in the Torah. This call to rest, this call to Shabbat, this intersection between an upward focus on God and an outward focus on neighbor is in fact a call that overflows and cascades down from these opening commands, from the opening command to have no other gods before you. 
So that's why when Yeshua, it's Shabbat, and they, in Luke chapter 6, and in every point where the focus has become not just where people are like, well, we have to do this and this and this and this and this and this, because as though God is a slave driver, you can't heal on Shabbat, and God says, no, 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 it's about this. Love God and love people comes together in this rest. The first command, the first point is, is going to bring us to this conclusion. Don't obscure your view of the God who frees you. It opens like this. <clears> that God spoke all these words saying, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. He says, here's who I am. I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, out of slavery. I liberated you. I set you free. Free from what? In Egypt, as far as the gods of Egypt were concerned, and Pharaoh was also considered a, a god in Egypt, if you were an Israelite, your whole purpose was to produce. Produce more. Build Pharaoh's supply cities. Build his storehouses. Feed his insatiable appetite. He will never say, okay, that's enough. Good job, take a break. More, more, more. The whole economic system of Egypt, the whole economic system of the gods of Egypt was unsatisfiable, insatiable, no rest. You weren't people, you were property. The gods of Egypt will suck you up and discard you. They will drain the life from you all your vitality, they will empty your resources and throw you away and move on. In contrast, the Lord says, here's who I am. I'm the rescuer. I made you to live, to truly live. I'm the one who brought you out from the bondage to the gods of insatiable productivity, the gods of Egypt. And he says, and let me tell you something. Those very gods of Egypt, those gods of Egypt will are in pursuit of you to kill you. Those gods of Egypt, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but they're still working. And I think they've immigrated to the United States a long time ago. Do more, do more. It's not enough. It's never enough. Work harder. You're lazy. You know you're lazy. Your value, your whole reason for being is that you can make me rich. You can make me wealthy. I'm all that matters. Make more bricks. An economic system of exploitation. A system that looked nothing like God's original intent for humanity. In the garden, it was eat, eat. We were one. No jockeying for position. No stepping on one another. So the Lord shows up and declares, keep your eyes on me. Don't forget who I am. Don't forget my character. I'm not like the gods that enslave you and exploit you. I'm the God who liberates you, who feeds you. Have no other gods before me. And literally what it says, actually, literally what it says in have no other gods before me is this. It says, there are not to be to you other gods before my face. They're not to be, you are not to have other gods in front of my face, obscuring my face, blocking your view of me. Don't let the gods that enslaved you and exploited you obscure the view of the face of the liberating God that desires to shine down on you. He says, I'm your liberator. And then we go to the last command. The last command, if, if, if we actually followed the last command, it would throw a serious wrench into the cogs of the modern advertising machine. Don't crave and long after what other people have. Whether you're listening to the radio watching television, reading the newspaper, or your news feed, scrolling through social media, driving along the highway past billboards, 
all along the way, there are strategically placed messages designed to get our attention. Designed to say, you need this. What you have is old. What you have is insufficient. What you have isn't enough. You need the upgrade. You need it. You need one more thing. This will make you better. This will make you safer. This will make you stronger. Or simply, finally, you'll be acceptable. Because in the advertisement needs you to accept this proposition as being a given, as being plainly true. They need you to believe that your present condition is insufficient and they have the answer. You're not enough. You don't have enough, which is why you're not happy. And here's the solution to that problem. This will make you happy, safe, fulfilled. Get it. Pursue it. You need it. You've got to get the whole collection. You're missing one thing. It's very rare when you get it. <sighs> Your soul will be complete. You've got to have it. There's a Veggie Tales. Um, there's a Veggie Tales. Uh, thing and one of my favorites was there's a, on one of the shows there's a advertisement of uh, Buzzsaw Louie and it's a toy every child needs it's a it's a, um, a little um, action figure that has a literal a buzzsaw on it um, like a like a circulating saw it's great every kid needs to have it so they're like so it's, it's supposed to be funny right and they go but the end of the commercial on this Veggie Tales goes goes uh, Billy has more toys than you and the little kid goes, I want, I want a buzzsaw Louie. Billy has, Billy has more toys than me. And the parent goes, who's Billy? I don't know, but he has more toys than me. <laughs> it's this anxious pursuit, craving more and more. If I just get that, just I need that. It flows from the insatiable demand of the gods of Egypt. So the Lord says, I'm going to bring you to the place that if you will do what I say, that you will not, as you love your neighbor, you will not crave what others have because you're com complete in me. Don't crave what other people have. Don't covet, he says, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. Now, this is a modern translation even. Problem for us is that none of us use the word covet unless we say, I covet your prayers for some strange reason. <laughs> you know, we don't say covet. So if in my mind I don't use this language, I don't ever think, um, and none of us have, well, I don't think, have manservants, maidservants, oxen, donkeys. So we're like, hey, I'm good. <laughs> but the, basically the word covet, hamad, means to crave, to desire, to want, to long for. Don't crave your neighbor's house. Don't crave having a different spouse. I know that rhymes. It's great. <laughs> Don't think the answer is if you had someone else's employees. To crave, to long after what someone else's tools or car or what they have, sewing machine. I want that. Could any verse be any more un-American? The craving for more, for better, for different, for new and improved. The need for the next big thing, for the upgrade. Standing in line for days for the upgrade. Fuels our economy. The lust for more is neatly packaged as the American dream. And this hunger, this want, this desire... 
this craving is the driving force that leads people to legitimize exploiting one another. Not looking out for others, but looking out for me. Looking out for number one, to be on top of Pharaoh's pyramid. Stepping on, using, exploiting, objectifying others in order to get the next big thing. A couple weeks ago, we celebrated our nation's birthday, Independence Day. And every year on that day, again, the lines from our Declaration of Independence, a brilliant document, says, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, first of all, let me say this. Any document, national document, historical document, we have the greatest documents, uh, I believe, in the world, except they're not inspired of the Holy Spirit. They're not Scripture. So don't put them on equal level to Scripture. If pursuit of happiness is defined as running toward and pursuing the God from whom all true blessing flows, great. Then that, then perhaps that's a noble pursuit. But if we're honest, it seems that in reality that what most Americans are in pursuit of, this elusive happiness, is whatever they define as what will make them happy. Selfish pursuit, the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of pleasure, the pursuit of self-indulgence and comfort. So that one of the biggest industries in our nation is pornography. People addicted to thinking the next whatever will satisfy them, but it's insatiable, never satisfied. It's destructive. It works in the opposite direction. But maybe the next thing. And they abuse We read the news, we get sick every day. How people decided selfishly that they would find their happiness without regard for how it was going to affect this other person. They were going to take what they wanted for them right now. In pursuit of my happiness, without regard for how my actions affect another, I have the right to build my wealth by exploiting others. If they're stupid enough or weak enough to allow that to happen, that's not my problem. That, according to many, is their unchangeable, in unalienable, God-given right. So the way the enemy works is he will take some of what God offers and mix in something to pollute it and dilute it and distort it. So we serve a God who is of life and of liberty And that if you will pursue God, his blessing overflows. But what drives the gods of Egypt that are driving things in this country, in the West, as it were, is this pursuit for more, 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 more. Anxiety is in pursuit of us. It's never enough. I read an article this week that popped into my newsfeed. It was about modern day American nomads. It's kind of a cool article. They basically leave their jobs, sell their homes, maybe buy an RV, and then they travel all over the country going into like stores, small towns, and trying to find things that are on clearance and, and things that are actually rare or have gone out of circulation, but now there's a demand for them. So apparently like Remember um, Bounce that does the dryer sheets? Bounce made a dryer bar that costs like five bucks that you stick inside your dryer and, you know, which is like, I've got to have that now. And so Bounce discontinued it. (laughs) They discontinued it. So so apparently there are people that will pay $300 for two of them, (laughs) right, on Amazon. And so, and so that, that these people go around to find things like that, that are on clearance, and then they turn around and sell it. This is the world. And so they're, they're nomads doing this, and it, it was interesting. But one of these nomads was reflecting on the lead up to the winter holidays, uh, the kind of crazy demand that builds up for different types of items. And it said this, it said, he said, too many people are unhappy, and I don't think they know why they're unhappy. So they're like, 
I'm going to buy a new toy, and that'll make me happy, and it doesn't. So many people are owned by their possessions. They're pursuing happiness, thinking happiness is found in a new toy, and they're running from God, from the God who pursues them. They think their happiness is completion is found in possessions and stuff and accumulation of wealth and property and pursuit of pleasure. I want my neighbor's house. I want a better spouse. If the green is, uh, you know, if the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, then maybe your neighbor's taking better care of their lawn. And if you had their lawn, it would die too. So maybe you need to take care of your lawn. I need a new phone. I need a new car. Then I'll attain what I'm in pursuit of, the ever-elusive happiness. There is this endless drive for progress. What have you done for me lately? Contentment? That's mediocrity. You've got to do more. You've got to be more. You're not enough. Pervades our society. Pervades our world. It's infiltrating, pervading into the body of Messiah. A gnawing anxiety. Your supply cities aren't enough. The Pharaoh of this world, all the gods of Egypt, driving us to fill an insatiable hunger for more. It's not enough, never enough. The taskmaster demands more. So the Lord opens by saying, don't have the gods of Egypt or any other of these other false gods blocking your view of my face. This is the face of freedom and liberation and life. I'm the one who brought you out with eagle's wings, brought you to myself. Don't let anything obscure my face from you. Keep your eyes on me. Don't let your desire for other people's stuff. When you start looking at your neighbor going, look, I want this, and I want this, and I want this, you're not able to love your neighbor. You love their stuff. You want their stuff. And you end up relationship Becomes, becomes exploitative. What can they do for me? How can I get what they have? The Lord says, keep your eyes on me. I'm the God who freed you from exploitation. And I want to work in you so that by the time you get to the end of this list, you'll see I'm calling you to live and be free and not to be ca captive to this insatiable hunger for what you don't have. And right in the center of this, the commands... He offers us a clear and a contrasting option. Either you have the slave-driving gods of Egypt, gods of anxiety and restlessness, and then you have the God who rests. The God of freedom, the God of Israel who freed us from the insatiable drive for more and invites us into his rest, into his shalom. We have an invitation to cease striving, to breathe, to live. He says, remember Yom Shabbat, to keep it holy. To remember Yizkor, or Zakar, it's not simply a mental act. It's not simply calling something to mind. It's to remember, Zakor is to actively, be actively attentive to what is remembered. So, for example, in Exodus 2.24, we read, it says, God heard their groaning, their sobbing, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the children of Israel, and he was concerned about them. Saying God remembered his covenant isn't describing um, an incident in which suddenly, out of nowhere, the people are groaning, and the Lord goes, oh my goodness, I made a, I, you know what, I made a promise to their grandparents, and I totally forgot, and now I've remembered now, he's, his remembering here is his calling to the forefront of his attention, his commitment to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob you know, in a way that is expressed in action. So, for instance, oh, through the Psalms, you'll hear the psalmist cry out, Lord, remember, 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 remember. And what he's saying is, Lord, can you put this in the forefront of what you're dealing with right now? Will you bring this? Will you remember and act? So we're told to remember the Shabbat, to keep it set apart. This is not an incidental Shabbat. This, this setting apart is not to be kind of a by-the-way, haphazard thing. It says, call this 
to mind, remember the Shabbat and act upon it with intent. Set apart this day. And it's here that the instruction, the command to rest, the command to Shabbat is rooted in us being called to reflect the nature of God. God created for six days and then God ceased from work. That God ceased from work, that he rested, tells us something about God. It does. I mean, it's amazing. God, God has worked in, into us where we, we have to rest, right? We have to rest. If we don't, we die. We have to sleep. If we don't rest, we get crazy first, and then we die. And in fact, in fact, we're actually made to rest. There's a certain rhythm in which our body goes with the earth. So that if you, I'm not great at this, but if you sleep between this time and this time, there's like a circadian rhythm. It's better for your heart. There's a, he's put, there's a rhythm, there's an order to what he's done. He made us to rest. That says something about him. He is not frenzied, panicked. He is ordered. He makes and then he fills and he enjoys. He creates and then he fills and enjoys. There's a rhythm to his creation, not chaotic. He creates life that reproduces. He said, let the land sprout grass, green plants, yielding seed, fruit trees making fruit. You know what's amazing? Is when a little baby girl is born, do you know that all the eggs she will ever have are already in her ovaries? She, he creates what can reproduce. He creates, there's not a striving, toiling there's a flow and a rhythm to what he does. His work is creative and beautiful and good. He says it's good. He says it's very good. Tov me'od. He created a universe spinning in motion like a beautiful dance with symbiosis and harmony rather than clashing in dissonance. But what is plain is that God does not create and then say, okay, 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 I, I created, and now I got to keep creating. If I, can, if I can do this in six days, what can I do in seven? <laughs> and then eight, and then nine, more, more. He creates life so that it may live. In fact, there's a beautiful expression of God's relationship to Shabbat in Exodus 31, 17. I'm reading it from the NASV because they, they nail the translation, I think, best. NASV gives kind of a word for word. It says, so the sons of Israel shall observe the Shabbat, the Sabbath, to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth but on the seventh day, he ceased from labor, labor and was refreshed. On the seventh day, he ceased from labor and was refreshed. Now, the words from labor are italicized there because it just says he ceased. So that's sort of added to give us the, the intention, the supposed intention of the meaning. But um, in Hebrew, it simply says, Shavat vai nafash. He ceased and nefesh, he refreshed. Nefesh means to breathe. It means life. It means soul. It's what's considered to mean the soul, but it me it's from, it means to breathe, breath. And so therefore to breathe is to live. And so the, the idea, so when you think even nefesh, when you think soul, it's not a Greek concept that has to do with some sort of just the inner being. But the soul, nefesh, is, is your whole life. It's the inner and the outer. It's the physical and the spiritual with your whole being. And so 
he ceased and lived. He ceased and breathed. He ceased and nephesh. He was his soul. He was. He lived. He made us to live in order to live. When someone gives you something for free, you know. Nothing's free. <laughs> when someone calls me and they're like, I want to tell you about a free three-day vacation. I'm like, can you just cut to what you want me to do? And I'm going to tell you no, and then I'm going to go ahead and get off the phone. But he doesn't, the strings attached are, I want to teach you to live. I call you to life. And what people say, no, he wants to control me. Yeah, he wants to control you like you want to control the toddler running toward a pool. That he's saying, come to me and I will show you. I who am life, I who am breath, will, if you will come to me and learn my ways and do what I say, you will learn the rhythm of life. You will live and be free. And the gods of Egypt come and say, we want to enslave you and dictate to you and keep you running and give you anxiety. Are you doing enough? Are you being enough? Is it ever enough? And so that even some people approach Shabbat with an anxiety. Do I need to do it this way? How do I do this? Hey, chill. And, and just rest in him. God rested and he breathed and lived. He is the creator, but he's more than the creator. He's not his work. He is not his labors. His work says something about his character, but he is more than that. And he lives and he loves and he made us to live and to love and he creates and he produces and he enjoys. <sighs> and he's refreshed and he breathes. The call to cease. Now, I don't know about you, because we've been, we've been raised swimming in this pool. Does a fish know it's wet? We've been raised swimming in this pool. There's a taskmaster that when you rest, there's a voice somewhere going, you are lazy. You know, you could be doing something productive with your life today. Do you have any idea how much you could have accomplished today? You lazy. This is ridiculous. Now, then what happens is some people will say, some people only ever always rest. And that kind of lethargic laziness uh, is, is self-centeredness. And it is not creative and it is not productive and it is not what is God is calling us to. What he's calling us to is be at Shabbat, at rest, in trust of him, as in our work, not with anxiety, but with trust in him. But when that seventh day comes, when that there is a day that you say, I'm ceasing. Sundown to sundown, I'm ceasing. I'm not going to rack my mind with crunching numbers today. That's not ceasing. Just because you're not up and running around doesn't mean you're ceasing. It's, it's saying, I'm going to trust you and rest in you today. I'm going to spend time loving you and loving those that you've given me. We were made to live. Shabbat is special because it's a command that's not only centered on the vertical love, love the Lord your God, but it also points us toward the relationship to one another. He says, in it, you shall not do any work, not you, not your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your cattle, nor the outsider that is within your gates. The one true God is a good God who says, breathe and rest. And not just you, your employees. You know, I read, I read something recently, um, <laughs> which, which made me laugh. There was in a business article, it was talking about Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is like, like other, other um, fast food uh, guys are just kind of, you know, hanging tight. And Chick-fil-A is skyrocketing. 
And they said, it, the thing that, and the person says, it doesn't make any sense. Because the owner of uh, uh, Chick-fil-A is a believer, and they, they have taken closed on Sundays for forever. So they take a day. Okay, they take a day set apart to God. You can argue about, you know, maybe that's like me when I go to sleep at 1 o'clock instead of on the circadian rhythm. I don't know. But they still take a day. I still need to sleep, and they take a day. And, and it's in honor to the Lord. And the, and they're, it's not just the owners. They're saying, I, we, want all our, we want our whole employees. All their employees, no, I've got that day. And the writer of the article is like, you know, they're, they're increasing even though they shut down a day a week. It doesn't make any sense to them. And they didn't even, there was no idea that there could actually be any connection there. Oh, and even though they've made certain stands about about their relationship to the word of God there, even though they've done these things and God is honoring. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I, I, I thought it was interesting, but, but uh, the Lord says the Shabbat is not just for you. Your rest is not to be on top of other people. And if you go back to that Exodus 19, you remember he says, if you'll do what I say, I, I brought you to myself to make you as a special people unto myself. Now, some people hear that it's special, and they think that means that we're his favorites. That he just, he made me special. <laughs> you and me, you and me. He says, I've made you a kingdom of priests. You know what priests do? He says, I've made you special, but the whole earth is mine. It's all mine. I've, I've set you apart for a reason. Priests are those who are reveal, work, communicate the word of God to people and bring people to the Lord. He's made us our specialness, our chosenness, our election, some call it, whatever, is not because somehow we're super awesome, but because he's chosen us with purpose to be a kingdom of priests, to bring people to him and bring his word to people. And so we bring his rest his Shabbat, it's not just about me, but to the employees and to others to bring his rest. We're to rest in him, to try to, to, to lay our lives in him, to lay aside anxiety and fear and to invite others into relationship of Shabbat. We're not to be in pursuit of the gods of this world, in pursuit of whatever defines my own happiness. Or to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To be in pursuit of life as God intends. My satisfaction, my contentment, peace, and shalom are not found at the end of a rainbow that the world has us pursuing. The true shalom for our souls, the true shalom that, the, that every person aches for, that true restfulness, peace and trust, and freedom that we were made for are found in relationship to God and being set apart for him in his Shabbat. So Yeshua says, come to me. You will find your rest in me. My, your hope is in me. I want to close with this. Psalm 23, we all know it. But it offers us this beautiful picture of the Shabbat into which God invites us. Adonai, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I, I will not lack. That's what it says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my nephesh, my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness, right paths, straight paths, for his name's sake. So you've got green pastures, still waters, and straight paths, total trust. Because I'm a sheep, but there's the shepherd. Total provision, sustenance, peace, and restoration. But there is even Shabbat rest, relational rest, when pastures don't look green. And when waters aren't so still. When paths seem to be rocky. And when enemies seem to be lurking. Even then, the shepherd is there. So even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid. 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I picture the sheep being able to to eat from the grass while the wolves snarl in the dark and the shepherd stands watching and I can eat at peace in the presence of my enemies because he is with me. He is there, no anxiety, no restlessness. It says, you have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Truly, surely, goodness, good and mercy, chesed, his loving kindness, his covenant loyalty will pursue me, is what it says. Chase me, is what it says. It doesn't say follow me. It says chases me, pursues me. Radaf, to chase after me. Certainly, goodness and faithfulness will chase after me. Not anxiety, not restlessness. When I am in pursuit of my desires, anxiety and restlessness are in pursuit of me. But when I rest in him, in ceasing and in trusting, his goodness and his love are in hot pursuit of me. And I need not run, but rather to let his love and let his goodness overtake me. He is good. And he calls us to worship him, the God who calls us to rest, not the gods of Egypt. Don't let them block your face of him. Don't let them lie to you about who he is. Don't let them make you be afraid. You walk in faithfulness. Work six days. Work your job. Work your days. But rest in him. And through those six days, let your heart and your mind be at rest and at trust and walk in faithfulness to him. Amen? 